The island of Manhattan was once a wild place, home to wandering bands of Native Americans. Then, everything changed. This is the story of how New York grew into one of the world's richest and most distinctive cities, transformed by a series of visionary feats of engineering, driven by irresistible economic energy and ambition. skyline in the world. The glittering towers of Lower Manhattan are engineering marvels that boast of New York's wealth and power. But nature was New York's first engineer. 20,000 years ago, Manhattan was a hundred miles inland on the edge of the great glacial sheets of the last ice age. As the ice melted, the Atlantic Ocean swept up to the North American coast. The glaciers had sculpted an ideal natural harbor around Manhattan. New York's destiny as one of the world's great trading cities was carved out. When the Dutch arrived here in 1624, they came not to colonize, but to do business. The Dutch West India Company called its settlement New Amsterdam after their own city of canals back home in the Netherlands. There are still traces of the town they built in New York City today, if you know where to look. Diana Wall is one of New York's foremost archaeologists. One of the earliest things that the Dutch built in New Amsterdam was, of course, a canal. The Dutch had three bridges that went across the canal, and one of them is still commemorated by the name of the street, Bridge Street, which still exists today. And Broad Street is where the canal itself used to be. But there's no bridge anymore, so I guess to be historically accurate, really what I should do is take off my shoes. If the canal was still there today, you'd have to get to Wall Street by boat. But back in the early 1600s, the trading post was operating at a loss. The Dutch West India Company made one last ditch attempt to save this troublesome backwater. They brought in a hardliner to run the colony and New Amsterdam was transformed. A defensive wall was built around the northern boundary of the town. The wall was built as a form of protection to keep out Indian attacks. They also wanted to protect themselves from the English. It didn't work. When the English conquered New Amsterdam, they came by sea. As the city expanded, the English demolished the wall. Today's Wall Street is where it used to be, and that's where this street got its name. Once, of course, the, uh, the English took over, they changed the name from New Amsterdam to New York after the Duke of York. Where the ferry piers of the Lower East Side are today was once New York's commercial port, but the usable waterfront here was very limited. The answer to this problem would come to sum up the spirit of New York. If nature hadn't supplied enough land, New Yorkers would just build some more. Much of the modern skyline sits on landfill land reclaimed from the river. These busy streets are all built on land where the East River used to be. If the island had its original shoreline restored now, this is what it would look like. As new blocks were added, new street names had to be invented to keep up. Pearl Street, named for the oysters on the shoreline. <laughs> 
then Water Street along the water's edge, then Front Street on the riverfront, finally South Street. Archaeologists have discovered that some of the city is in fact built on garbage. A few years ago, Diana Wall was able to excavate a section of landfill on the site where an office building was to be constructed. Here we are in the middle of what was the East River. Today you can see an office tower behind me. But in the 1790s, up until the 1790s, this was really out in the middle of the river. As a huge watertight pit for the block's foundations was created, Diana and her colleagues had a unique chance to dig all the way down to what was once the bottom of the East River. It opened a window on how engineers had created new sections of land 200 years before. They found perfectly preserved wooden wharves, which had once been at the water's edge where boats had tied up. What they did was they made the basis of the wharves near shore, and then what they would do is they would float it out into place. Then they would fill the wharf with cobbles, and they would use that to sink the wharves in place. Then they would begin to put the landfill in behind it. A cross-section of what's beneath this part of Manhattan would reveal how almost anything, including trash, might be used for this landfill. Archaeologists are always really excited about digging, particularly an early landfill, because you often find an awful lot of artifacts in the refuse of the city. As a quick fix way of creating a structure to hold landfill, ships and boats would sometimes be sunk and buried. There's one still here under the South Street Seaport Museum. By the end of the 18th century, New York had become the world's third busiest port after London and Philadelphia. After independence, the federal government was based in New York for five years. George Washington was inaugurated here in 1789. But a year later, Washington, D.C. was chosen as the nation's capital city and New York was freed to become the city of capital. New York's financial machine would prove vital to the city's success. It would provide the cash to turn mere ambition into reality. The early 1800s were years of breathtaking but undisciplined growth. New York was now America's biggest city its 80,000 citizens crammed into the chaotic streets of Lower Manhattan. If the city was going to prosper, it desperately needed some order. In a single audacious move, the city's leaders created a template for Manhattan's future development, a rigid grid plan which would brand New York forever. To draw up their plan, the street commissioners needed an accurate survey of Manhattan, but at the time, no such thing existed. A young man in his 20s, John Randall Jr., was entrusted with the mammoth task of making one. Randall would spend more than 10 years in the process. For Reuben Redwood, a geographer who's about the same age as John Randall was when he began his survey. The commissioner's grid plan and Randall's part in it have become something of an obsession. The plan was published as a giant map in 1811. This copy in New York's public library is some eight feet long. It's been described as the most important document in the history of the city. As you can see, it's a pretty large map, about six pieces um, and put it together. And at the time, uh, the cities extended to about what's now Houston Street, which was called North Street at the time. The plan shows an imaginary grid of streets stretching over the rest of Manhattan, which was then almost uninhabited. It shows extraordinary faith in New York's destiny, but some have criticized it. <laughs> 
urban planners by and large say that the grid plan is an unimaginative plan. Um, and uh, many of them recommend that they should have used diagonals such as in Washington, D.C. But what the original commissioners were doing was imagining the city of the future. They were envisioning an imperial metropolis. Their vision could not have been further from the real landscape of Manhattan 200 years ago. This pre-grid scene is revealed in a little-known treasure of the Manhattan Borough President's Office. 92 maps drawn by John Randall called the farm maps. When most people think of uh, Manhattan, they think of a concrete landscape that's flat. Uh, and, and when we look at the Randall farm maps, we see a much different landscape with wetlands, streams, inlets. But superimposed on that pre-grid landscape are the imaginary streets and avenues of the grid plan. Here you can see the Harlem River uh, coming up straight into 10th Avenue. Um, 10th Avenue in this intersection is basically underwater at the time. The buildings in the middle of the different streets and avenues of the grid plan. And in fact, I counted all of the buildings and I found that about 40% of all of the pre-existing buildings were in the middle of the street or an avenue of the future grid plan. And they would eventually have to be demolished. The plan incensed the owners of such properties. There's a legend that Randall was pelted with artichokes and dogs were unleashed on him. John Randall, I have an arrest In one board. case, Randall was arrested for trespassing on the property of a man called John Mills. And you can see here is a building of John Mills uh, right in the middle of 6th Avenue. If the avenue was built, the house would obviously have to go. So you can see why perhaps uh, Mr. Mills was a bit upset at, at the surveyors. Randall's maps record so much information about the lie of the land before the grid that Rubin has been able to create a three-dimensional computerized image of Manhattan. And you can zoom around um, and see different angles of the pre-grid Manhattan landscape. Thanks to Randall, we can see what the island looked like before the commissioners stamped their uncompromising grid plan on it. The grid is one of the few things that has remained constant in a city of permanent change. Of a restless urge to grow driven by its great entrepreneurs and leaders. In the early 19th century, New York was in fierce competition with other ports on the East Coast. Whoever succeeded in tapping the growing farming and industrial resources of the American West would have struck gold. But all down the eastern seaboard, the Appalachian mountain range blocked the way. Except, that is, for the gap some 200 miles north of New York City, created by the Mohawk Valley. Ships had always been able to sail up the wide, deep Hudson River from New York to Albany. What if Albany could be linked to Lake Erie, and so to the riches of the West, with a canal? Would such a thing even be possible? Most people thought it was a bad idea. Thomas Jefferson considered the canal sheer madness. So the federal government thought the canal was a bad idea. It was up to New York State alone to build this canal. The canals in Europe and England were generally short canals, 20 and 30 and 50 miles in length. And here it was proposed by upstart Americans with absolutely no engineering skills to build what would be the longest canal in the world. It may have seemed crazy, but they went ahead anyway. The sheer scale of the project was immense. The canal would be 363 miles long, with 83 locks and 18 aqueducts, all to be built without modern machinery. The first spade of dirt on the Erie Canal was dug here in Rome, New York where there's now a museum run by blacksmith and canal expert Mike Molesky. The first difficulty is to remove all the trees. This was very heavily forested, so all the trees had to be cut down. And then the digging could begin. 
you had to dig by hand with picks and shovels. You used oxen and horses and a plow and a drag scraper. And that's if you had good dirt to work in. You could encounter bedrock you had to chisel through. But you might encounter swamp, quicksand, muck, running sand, black soil. That There were also mosquitoes that had malaria. They weren't aware of malaria. They weren't aware that it could kill you. But quite apart from the physical challenges, there was a technical problem which threatened to sink the whole canal scheme. Structures called locks were needed to raise or lower barges where the level of the canal changed. But the most readily available building material in New York State was wood. This was no good for locks because it would rot. The answer was to build most of the structure of a lock out of stone. The trouble with that is that you had to make the joints between the stone waterproof. But at the time, waterproof cement was not made in the United States, and it was far too expensive to import. Without waterproof cement, there would be no durable locks. And without locks, there could be no canal. Just by chance, we found the materials needed to make hydraulic cement some 30 miles west of us. That was literally the savior in building the canal. An engineer, Canvas White, had managed to find the particular kind of limestone needed to make hydraulic cement. New York State turned out to have plentiful supplies. This is a limestone mine, a kind of underground quarry. It's about 16 acres altogether of property, and about eight acres of that underground have been mined out. It's a room and pillar mine, meaning these type of pillars were left to support the ceiling uh, of, the, of the, the mine itself. Not any limestone will do for hydraulic cement. Historian Dietrich Werner is going to recreate the experiment that Canvas White carried out to see if he had found the right kind of rock. So I'll give it a whack. taken the limestone that he brought from the, uh, the quarries, and then they would put it to the forge and roast the rock, roast it. That was what they would call it. Um, if you can get that going a little bit. And this process would take about 12 hours or so. Once the rocks of limestone had been cooked, Canvas White would have broken them up and then ground them into a powder, effectively cement powder. Okay, we'll be adding a little water to mix the uh, cement. And then we will put this in a bucket of water to see if it hardens overnight. So let me put that in here. When Canvas White took this pat of cement out and chimed it on the side of his bucket and found out it really was hard, he probably said Eureka. <laughs> After eight years of construction, the Erie Canal opened. It was a stunning success. The cost of transporting a ton of grain from the Finger Lakes to New York City was slashed from $100 to just six. The Port of New York became the natural focal point for trade between the heartland of America and the rest of the world. The city gained a head start that it never lost trade, all the commerce, all the money that changed hands made New York grow into the amazing city it is today. That started with the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825. Success bred success. Railroads added to the momentum of New York's growth, often following canal routes. The city became the natural point of arrival for hundreds of thousands of immigrants 
but New York began to suffocate under the pressure of its own expansion. The grid plan had allowed for no large public spaces, so the city's leaders decided to carve out a huge park right in the middle of Manhattan. It looks like a slice of natural beauty preserved, but the truth is very different. These green acres are no accident of geography. They're a feat of engineering. Central Park is the biggest, most beautiful fake in America. As one man knows better than most, landscape architect Doug Blonsky. You know, it looks like nature that you're here, but it really is not at all. It is, it is kind of a Disney world. It is really a phenomenal piece of landscape art. As New York became ever more crowded in the mid-19th century, the lack of park space had begun to look like a serious problem. City leaders commandeered 843 acres of central Manhattan as a park for the people. It was to promote civic health, but also to rival the great city parks of Europe. The land they chose in the center of Manhattan was hardly a rural idyll at the time. It was really the nastier park, uh, part of Manhattan. It was a uh, very scrubby, very marshy area with a few uh, little villages and a lot of squatters, but not very inhabited. The few inhabitants were bought out or evicted, and a competition was held to design the park. The winning plan proposed a series of picturesque vistas, like scenes from paintings that the visitor would walk through as if through a gallery. A series of beautiful experiences. You'd go from one landscape to the next, you'd look up in the corner and you'd see something else interesting and then that would cause you to want to go visit that. And, uh, that was the whole goal. Is there's no straight pathways, everything meanders. Uh, the park is rectangular and, and so it fits perfectly within the grid. Uh, but then the moment you walk in from the perimeter wall, uh, the whole thing changes. But almost nothing of the plan actually existed in nature, apart from great outcrops of rock known as Manhattan Schist. These couldn't be moved, so everything else was landscaped around them. More than 3,000 men toiled for over a decade to transform a wilderness into a picture book. With the most basic of tools, they created streams and cascades and hills and meadows bringing in a million cartloads of topsoil. Having a park in the middle of the city might have cut the east and west sides off from each other. And yet, having roads crossing the park could have ruined it. The designer's solution to this problem was inspired. Sink the roads below the level of the rest of the park. But this sometimes meant cutting through solid rock. This park is built on Manhattan schist. This is the tough bedrock that anchors the skyscrapers. They had to blast the bedrock so that the uh, uh, roads could be sunk to the proper grade. Uh, and that was a, another huge engineering feat. The plan was so successful that even today's traffic courses through almost unseen and unheard. Creating the rest of the park demanded no less ingenuity and hard labor. This is a photograph of a swampy stretch of farmland before the park was made. <laughs> 
And this is how the designers propose to transform it into a beautiful lake. Today, it looks as if it's been there forever. So do all the other ponds and streams, none of which owes its existence to nature. Every boulder that is in place to make this phenomenal cascade was put in by man. But we can also turn a water buff just like that. And I'll show you a little secret if you want to take a look and we'll turn this one off. All the water bodies in Central Park are really fed by the city water system and also by the rain. This is where we turn the valve, which bypasses the cascade. And now this valve pipe goes right to a manhole over there that uh, Charlie and Ray will open up for us. And so we can see the actual water gushing into this very large cavern underneath, which causes the diversion, so then the cascade goes dry. This drainage plan, drawn up before Central Park was created, reveals how marshy the place was. A large area drains into the southeastern corner of the park, where the 59th Street Pond is today. There's a great historic photograph of the pond that uh, showed how much of a, a low-lying bog wetland this was. So there's probably almost 100 acres of parkland that ends up draining right into this pond. So if we know it's gonna rain really heavy tonight, we will actually lower this water body uh, by several inches to a foot. Without this precaution, the pond could easily flood. Large underground weirs contain valves to drain off the excess water into the city sewer system. Nature is always doing her best to return the park to its original state. Without careful planning, rain would wash the soil from the slopes and the lakes would silt up, damaging the wildlife habitat. Hidden underground are the 150-year-old solutions to this problem, called sand traps. Now this is one of the main uh, drainage vaults Water comes down here, and it has a lot of silt in it. It gets to settle out around this sand trap, and it actually goes in inside here. The silt and sand is cleaned out regularly. <laughs> Meanwhile, up above, lovers of the park probably have little idea of how hard technology is working for them in this artfully rural paradise. Look at the people in this park today. Look how magnificent the park is. I think that's a testament to just absolutely incredible design success. They clearly did it right. During the second half of the 19th century, immigrants poured into New York, and the city's growth outstripped all predictions. By 1870, 50,000 people were commuting to Manhattan every day across the East River from Brooklyn. Soon, the ferry companies would not be able to cope and so the most ambitious engineering project of the 19th century was born. When the Brooklyn Bridge opened in 1883, it seemed miraculous, the longest suspension bridge of its day. The central span nearly 1,600 feet long, the towers nearly 280 feet high, the roadway broader than Broadway.
lattice work of cables supporting the road and walkways is a spectacular piece of engineering, permanently on show. But hidden under the water is an even more staggering achievement. The work of the so-called sand hogs, who had to burrow deep below the East River to make the foundations of the bridge's massive towers. If you look at the river here, they hit, uh, bedrock was about 80 feet down on the bottom of, underneath the water on the bottom of the river, so you had to get down to a solid footing for a foundation to support the great weight of this now magnificent bridge. A huge box called a caisson, which was the size of a city block and made of wood and steel, was floated out into the river. As the granite blocks of the tower were built up on top of it, it sank down to the riverbed. The caisson was open at the bottom, and as the workers excavated, it would sink further and further, eventually down to bedrock. Pumping the caisson full of compressed air prevented the river water from rushing in. The air pressure counterbalanced the pressure of the water. Workers got in and out of the caisson through an airlock. Conditions inside were horrific. You know, imagine working in an environment where the air in the caisson is probably as much as 80 pounds over atmospheric pressure. So you're working in a very intense atmosphere, but there's not a lot of oxygen, it's very loud, it's very hot, and the fatigue sets in immediately. It's a bit harder to breathe. Um, the air is very dead and still. It's probably about the closest thing you could get to hell on earth, realistically. Tragically, nothing was known about the dangers of working under pressure. Descending into deep water causes nitrogen to dissolve into the bloodstream. If a diver surfaces too quickly, the gas re-emerges as bubbles, causing pains and nausea. The bends. The sandhogs called it caisson's disease, and it was often fatal. A couple guys I worked with um, as a sandhog who had the bends working on jobs were decompressing properly. And the, the one guy described it simply as this, is it felt like he was on fire from the inside out. And then he actually said if he had a big gun with a bullet in it, he would have put it in his head to stop the pain. When you first get the caisson's disease, there's a slurring of the speech, there's a staggering of the gait. There's really symptoms that are very the same as intoxication. And a lot of these were Irish immigrants and there was this sort of negative stereotype, oh, they're just drunken patties. Getting all the mud and rock the sandhogs were so painfully excavating out of the sealed chamber required a huge leap of engineering imagination. Shafts, open at the top and bottom, ran through the caisson roof and down into the chamber. They were filled with water. The bottom of the shaft ended in a pool dug into the river bed. Sand hogs would push the spoil into this pool under the shaft. The column of water was supported in the shaft as if in a barometer. The air pressure inside kept the water from gushing down into the chamber. A grab was lowered through the shaft to scoop up a load. And it was then winched back up. The dirt was dumped into a truck and then taken off by barge. But it wasn't all soft silt down there. They started hitting a lot of rock, a lot of very huge boulders. And, you know, how do you break up a boulder when you don't have explosives? You know, I've done that work. It's basically just chipping away at it. And underneath New York City is some of the hardest rock in the world. They decided to try to use some black powder down there, some explosives, which, you know, is highly volatile. It is insane. I would not want to be down there. When the towers had been completed, the rest of the bridge could be suspended between them. Spinning the cables was a dazzling and dangerous trapeze act. There were well-publicized accidents and fatalities. But there can be little doubt that the hidden hell of the caissons claimed many more lives which went unrecorded.
the Samhogs literally toiled in obscurity, and a lot of them died in obscurity. Some people say only a few men died, but estimates range as high as 150, which I think is probably more accurate, because a lot of the men didn't, if they didn't die at the site, they would die later from the caisson disease, sometimes that night, sometimes a week later. And so who knows? I mean, how many guys just went back into the ghettos of Manhattan and, and, and died? Brooklyn Bridge was so brilliantly engineered that it can easily bear the 144,000 vehicles that now cross it every day. In 1900, after a century of unparalleled expansion, the population of New York City exceeded that of Paris. Now, New York would lead the way into a new technological age, and one phenomenon above all that arrived here first would change not only this city, but the world. Electricity. Today, New York is the definitive big city of bright lights. But just over a century ago, all of this was unimaginable. In the 1870s, Electric arc lights illuminated some thoroughfares such as Broadway, but they were far too powerful for homes and businesses. The man who sparked the electrical revolution, which would bring light and power to everyone, was Thomas Edison. For Edison, New York was the place to be. You had Wall Street. This is where the media was. Uh, this is where there were resources that were unimaginable other places. Edison marked out a small area in downtown Manhattan to be the first district to be wired for electricity. But there was just one snag with his grand plans. He hadn't actually invented the light bulb yet. It was still on the drawing board at his laboratory in nearby Menlo Park. When Edison said he had solved the problem uh, only a few months after having invented the phonograph, which gave him the uh, appellation, the Wizard of Menlo Park, the inventor of the age, uh, people thought he could do anything. Edison had to invent not only the light bulb, but a whole system to generate and deliver electricity. Within just 18 months, he'd built the first power station in Pearl Street and laid some 80,000 feet of underground cables, though insulating them was sometimes a problem. In late August, just before they were getting ready to start the station up, they were testing it, and it was kind of a wet day, and they discovered that there was a leak, that somebody had driven a spike into one of the uh, cables, and electricity was kind of leaking up onto the ground. And uh, a horse came by, and the next thing you knew, it reared up, because it had been shocked, and folks started gathering, watching the horses coming by and getting shocks, and finally they had to send a repair crew. In fact, there's still a manhole cover today where the uh, Edison lines would have been. By the fall of 1882, Edison's system was complete. But would it work? At 3 p.m. on the 4th of September, he flipped the master switch. Uh, the lights came on about 3 o'clock, but of course it wasn't dark yet. But slowly as darkness came on and the lights got brighter and brighter, and then finally as darkness fell, it was, it was like a wonderland for people in the district. Here was this strong, steady light as opposed to the flickering glass light. And for most people, this seemed to be the future, to herald the future. Having electric lights so early lent more cachet to the image of New York, this industrial uh, financial city that was constantly on the go 24 hours a day. And that's the image we still have in New York, and this is where it begins. Today, electrical cables are just part of a whole underground world, keeping the great organism of New York alive. The city's vital arteries are underground, water, sewers, gas, steam, subways. <laughs> Meanwhile, the New York everyone recognizes is the one above ground, way above ground. <laughs> 
Yet little more than a hundred years ago, New York's most prominent landmark was the spire of Trinity Church. Now, it's lost amongst the cathedrals built to commerce. New York is the ultimate city of towers. One of America's foremost authorities on skyscrapers is writer Paul Goldberger. New York is where the skyscraper grew big, right, where the skyscraper became a work of art. In the early 20th century, skyscrapers seemed to embody the spirit of the age. Artists and filmmakers imagined outrageously futuristic images of the city, which in fact proved to be not so far from reality. And New York in particular would define modernity in the world. Lots of skyscrapers all together and a sense of energy and congestion and all these people rushing around and bridges in the sky from one building to the next and airships and all kinds of things. Put in the sense that the city is almost like some powerful organic thing in which there is such energy, such passion that it cannot be stopped. It just pushes and pushes through. Some of New York's most traditional looking buildings are secretly ancestors of the skyscraper. They look like stone buildings, but in fact their fronts are molded from cast iron. One of the ways we figure out whether a building is really cast iron is to bring a magnet. And that tells you that what you think is stone is in fact actually an iron building. The cast iron test works. These prefabricated cast iron fronts were simply hung onto ordinary brick buildings. But really tall buildings could never be built of brick because their walls would have to be impossibly thick to cope with their own weight. In the late 19th century, New York's rival in the race to build high, Chicago, was the first to use a steel frame to support a building. It became a key principle in skyscraper engineering. But New York scored a first with an equally vital invention. Without it, the skyscrapers which have come to define the city would never have got off the ground. The first office block to boast a passenger elevator was New York's Equitable Life Building. Until then, the lower floors of a building had been the most prestigious. Today, we assume that in a tall office building, the top floors are more valuable than the lower floors. They rent for more money. Before the elevator, it was the opposite, because who wanted to climb stairs? So the most valuable floors were one or two, maybe. Once the elevator was invented, the economics turned upside down, and suddenly the top floors became the most desirable. This was a profound invention that would transform the nature of cities around the world. The more rentable space you can get on a single plot of land, the more you can make out of it. That's one reason to build high. Today, with Manhattan so densely built up, there's almost no other way to go except up. But at the beginning of the 20th century, a building like the Woolworth, the tallest of its day, didn't really have to be so high because of lack of space. It's a myth that they had to build up in Manhattan because there wasn't enough room. Uh, nonsense. They went up because that was how you symbolized that you were powerful, rich, important, and that you were representing a new world, time, a new life, a new century. The Woolworth Building embodied that absolutely. The Woolworth Building held the title of tallest building in the world for 17 years. Then, in 1930, Another New York building snatched the crown away, 
but only after a no-holds-barred fight between two rival architects. At first, it looked as if the Bank of Manhattan Company building at 40 Wall Street was going to win the race. According to the plans, it was a few feet higher than its rival, the Chrysler Building, which was going up on 42nd Street. The builders of 40 Wall Street were jubilant, but they were in for a perfectly timed and devastating surprise. The architect of the Chrysler Building had a brilliant idea. He assembled inside the observation deck of the Chrysler an additional spire after 40 Wall Street had been finished. Immediately, the Chrysler shot up. With the secret spire on the top that was actually lifted through the roof. At that point, there was nothing they could do except concede that the Chrysler Building was, in fact, the world's tallest building. But not for long. Work had already begun on the building that would become synonymous with the word skyscraper. The builders of the Empire State Building set out to go one better than Chrysler, and they succeeded famously. The Empire State Building was brilliantly engineered, and it was built very fast. They had organized it like a military campaign, with many of the parts of the building prepared in advance and just brought in. It has become the most famous skyscraper profile in the world. And at the top of that profile, a spire which was originally designed to be a mooring mast for airships. Fly across the Atlantic on an airship, and then you dock right at the top of the Empire State Building and you descend by elevator and arrive in New York pretty wonderful notion, except it made absolutely no sense whatsoever. In reality, the winds were too high and airships too unstable even to dock, let alone to allow passengers on and off. It was tried once and never again. It was an insane romantic idea that should never have gotten as far as it did, but it shows us the power of the romance of the skyscraper at that point. In 1973, the Empire State Building lost the title of tallest building in the world to the twin towers of the World Trade Center. The towers were New York's most prominent skyscrapers until the tragic events of September 11, 2001. For a long time, the biggest things you could see from here were the twin towers of the World Trade Center. For the last almost 30 years, they, they defined the Manhattan skyline. They were the tallest buildings by virtue of being a pair. They were different from anything else. And they were the only things in New York that were taller than the Empire State Building. The new skyline has an important symbolic role, not only to provide a memorial for everything that's gone, but also to create a bold new profile in the spirit of the city. One of the best ways in which we can remember is to keep going. The ambition of New York is one of the things that has to be put back there as much as a memory of the people who were lost. New York's ambition has never failed it before. More than any other city, it is the product of sheer willpower whether pushing back the wild river, engineering natural beauty out of a wasteland, spanning untried distances across water, or reaching for the sky. The whole of New York is breathtaking evidence of the unstoppable energy of the people who built this city.